In medieval Europe, the Catholic Church held a level of power and influence over the population that is almost inconceivable today. This power came from a combination of factors, including persuasion, corruption, and coercion, but most of all, straight-up fear-mongering. Yes, the medieval church was heavily invested in the business of scaring the faithful into staying faithful. Today, we're going to take a look at how the medieval Catholic Church frightened its parishioners into obedience. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know what religious history you would like to hear more about. Okay, let's see some self-punishment for having done wrong. We're going medieval on you. These days, when people hear the term Hellmouth, they're most likely to think of the television series Buffy the Vampire Slayer, if they think of anything at all. Indeed, modern visitors to medieval churches and cathedrals would probably regard the frightening sculpted images appearing over the entryway as mere art or ornamentation. But for the populace of the medieval era, who were superstitious and uneducated, the image of the Hellmouth was nothing short of terrifying. The Hellmouth was typically depicted as a ferocious beast devouring sinners during the Last Judgment. It was the first thing that parishioners would see on their way into the sanctuary, and the message was crystal clear. Obey the church, or this will happen to you. Wow, they were very, very subtle. Purgatory, in the Catholic religion, is an intermediate state that comes after death where people can expiate their sins before moving on to heaven. In medieval times, churchgoers were extremely concerned about how much time they might have to spend there. Luckily, there were several ways a person could ensure their wait wouldn't be overly long. For example, they could donate money and goods to the church, attend services regularly, or even purchase a certificate that could get them an early release. But for those who absolutely, positively had to be sure they would skip purgatory entirely, there was only one surefire way, donate one of their children to the church. In ancient times, religions may have demanded human sacrifice to appease their gods. But the medieval church had a more pragmatic use for these children, namely, replenishing their own numbers. The clergy, of course, is supposed to be celibate, so new priests, nuns, and monks had to be recruited from the general population. While these new recruits didn't have to be children, the church preferred them because they were easier to mold. Hmm, didn't the families miss their children? Certainly. But in an era where poverty was common and many already had too many mouths to feed, there was no real choice. What's more, the arrangement could actually wind up being beneficial to everyone involved. For the child, being raised by the church would mean eating better, staying cleaner, and receiving an education. For the parents, the arrangement meant saving money and resources that could be spent on the rest of the family. However, while being raised by the church meant having a full belly, a warm place to sleep, and an education, there was also, predictably, a much darker side to the practice. Many children are known to have been victimized by church leaders in a number of inappropriate ways. Accounts of those who found themselves trapped in a miserable, abusive existence within the church have survived to this very day. To most modern observers, seeing a statue weep would be greeted by immediate skepticism. One might suppose the statue had been cracked and taken on water from some outside source, or perhaps deception was involved and some devious person placed a water hose inside the statue to create an illusion. Seeing a statue weep blood might make one suspect something rusty was leaking onto it. Yet even today we hear reports of people witnessing statues they believe are crying real tears or bleeding real blood. Often they believe these tears are sent by Christ or some other heavenly figure. So you can imagine how easily the overwhelmingly superstitious and religious population of medieval days would have easily accepted such a sight. Indeed, weeping and bleeding statues were commonly considered powerful omens of evil or sad events to come, an interpretation that was quite useful for a church seeking to encourage continued obedience. While you'd probably think there's no way to buy oneself out of having committed terrible sins, you'd be dead wrong. In the medieval era, as much as today, the church was quite fond of money, and the faithful could actually buy forgiveness with cash. If enough money was involved, nothing was unforgivable. Even more convenient was that you could purchase a pardon in advance for something you hadn't even done yet. Plan to rob or kill someone? No problem. Just buy yourself an advance pardon and have a good time. 
It was a great arrangement for those who could afford it, and it made the church a fortune. Call it your get-out-of-jail card for the afterlife. One of the church's other biggest money makers was selling tickets out of purgatory, and you could purchase one not just for yourself, but also for your deceased loved ones. Worried that your parents or grandparents have been denied entrance to heaven and are trapped in purgatory? No problem. Purchase the pardon card. For the right price, the church would literally issue you an actual physical certificate that proved your loved one was on the way to heaven. The pardon card. Don't leave life without it. Some things never change. For example, adulterers in medieval times feared pretty much the same exact things modern ones do, namely getting caught. These days, a revelation like that would probably lead to couples therapy or possibly a divorce. But in the medieval era, that kind of exposure would mean being made an object of public shaming and ridicule. In fact, the term walk of shame originated in that era and was meant quite literally. Accused adulterers might be required to walk nude through the streets under the ridicule of friends and neighbors. Game of Thrones fans are probably thinking of Queen Cersei's famous walk of shame right about now, which was based directly on this real-life practice. Not surprisingly, despite this heavy punishment, adultery remained popular. For some, the shame is part of the game. The aforementioned Hellmouth sculptures that hung over the church doors were an effective mood setter, but they were only the beginning. Once inside the church, the parishioner would be graded by images of the end of the world, the Last Judgment, and so-called doom paintings, which depicted the faithful rejoicing with God in heaven, while the sinners boiled in a lake of fire. That's not all, though. Churches were often filled with altarpieces, statues of tortured saints, and all manner of other images of sinners being punished in hell. The church employed the greatest artists of the day to create these works, and those artists often had vivid and terrifying imaginations. For the medieval church, the need to keep a grip on their power and influence was rivaled only by the drive to make money. Church officials at all levels were primarily concerned with selling get-out-of-purgatory certificates. They also enjoyed spreading the word about how working for the church would ensure your social position on earth and reserve you a spot in heaven. This fixation on profit went so far, parishioners were often warned that any and all expendable income they came into possession of should be given directly to the church. Depending on a person's social status, contributions could come in various forms. If you were poor, you could give livestock or whatever coins you were able to spare. Upper and middle class families, and yes, there was a burgeoning middle class at this point, were also under a great deal of pressure to give. Examples of what such people might donate to stay in the church's good graces include silver candlesticks, linen altar cloths, or even a church pew. The extremely wealthy might even donate something as expensive as an ornate altarpiece or stained glass window, which might depict holy figures along with members of the donor's family. Ever hear someone refer to the seventh level of hell? You probably have, though you may not have realized that phrases like that are an allusion to the first part of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, namely, The Inferno. This three-part epic poem, written in the 14th century, chillingly details the experience of going through hell, purgatory, and heaven. Considered one of the greatest works of Western literature, the Divine Comedy heavily inspired the artist who created the Hellmouths, as well as all the imagery within the church depicting sinners in hellish circumstances. Ironically, the poem was really just an excuse for its author to blow off steam at his enemies. But it was also something a lot of people could relate to, including the church. In fact, for the church, Dante's Inferno was an invaluable resource for frightening the faithful into strict obedience. Though, of course, much like the rest of their agenda, this had much more to do with keeping people in the habit of giving their money, property, and children over to the church than it did with saving anyone's soul. Medieval cathedrals were often enormous, elaborate buildings, and the fact that many still stand today is a testament to human mastery of architecture, physics, and masonry. These buildings often took several generations to fully construct, and villages and cities would rise up around them. Building a cathedral was difficult and dangerous, but also allowed for an unparalleled level of artistic creativity. 
For example, the original builders would often carve their own faces into the statuary and motifs on display both inside and outside the buildings. Despite this freedom, the sculptors and masons had to work within the artistic styles favored by the church. This included imagery of Jesus, Mary, and the saints, but also would typically include figures of demons and gargoyles on the building's exterior. These figures would often be depicted near doorways or high up on spires. This way, they could cast their unnerving gazes down upon the sinners entering the church, inspiring them to seek forgiveness and stay obedient. Despite all the fear-mongering the church engaged in to keep their parishioners in line, there are always those who just don't care. Whether because they didn't believe in it or simply felt an eternity of punishment was a fair price for the sins they sought to engage in, the medieval era had plenty of folks who frequently skipped church services. Some preferred to spend their time drinking, gambling, visiting prostitutes, and some just like sleeping late. Whatever the case, sins like these were punishable offenses. However, as you may have guessed, these sins were absolutely forgivable if the right financial price was paid to the church. And since a failure or refusal to pay the fine constituted a one-way ticket to hell, most people paid up. So what do you think? Does guilt play a part in your everyday obedience? We see you, sinner. Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.